So yeah, and let me now just sort of slightly modulate from the, you know, the elementary historian to the, to the art historian. Um, art history, which is what I am. Um, art history, curiously, does exist in direct proximity to huge concentrations of wealth. <laughs> uh, unlike the study of literature or what, you know, I mean, uh, our objects are worth real heavy money, right? Give me, give me a dozen or twenty Cezannes and I uh, actually compete with BP as a patron. <laughs> So, uh, so I've had long experience, 40 years of experience in, uh, of, of working in a discipline uh, in direct relation to a real market in my objects of study um, and even in the conclusions of my study, all right? Attribution. If I say that's a Cezanne, that's real money involved. Well. What are the dangers, in my view, as I've learned them, of, of, of uh, the pursuit of knowledge uh, existing in this kind of relation to market concerns and corporate interests? Twofold, really. I mean, there is a first one, and it's pretty obvious, and nobody wants to quite talk about it, especially vis-a-vis -vis the sciences, but there is a very straightforward danger of corruption that you sell your services, that you alter your conclusions. Maybe almost half consciously you find yourself uh, giving the benefit of the doubt. There is that danger, and I could tell you plenty of stories about how that plays out. But the, the more profound danger is of not of outright corruption, but of a warping and closing down of intellectual horizons. The establishment of a narrow but overwhelming paradigm of what counts as knowledge in a particular discipline under the pressure of demand, of uh, a very straightforward social and economic power that wants your services about this, this, and this, and not that, that, and that. And I can tell you art history has suffered and suffered gravely from that over the course of the century. It's always a danger in intellectual life. Um, I, I probably haven't got time to go into this, although it's the most fascinating in intellectual subjects. Right? The possibility always the danger of a discipline um, under varying kinds of pressures closing down into one view and one view only of the proper questions it can ask, the proper protocols and procedures it can uh, measure, uh, its intellectual horizons. I mean, I, as a historian, let me give you just very, very briefly, right, one, one, one very important Look, I mean, who cares about art history in a certain sense? But, look, but supposing you were a historian and you were confronted with the disaster of the 20th century. It, it's not an academic question. It's an urgent question of public policy and understanding to try to reach some kind of conclusions about why the 20th century was unprecedented in the level of interstate and intrastate violence. Well, a paradigm, one framework of answering that question has dominated historical studies, I would say, over the last 50 years. Uh, it comes under the handy name totalitarianism. That the unprecedented level of public violence in the 20th century was centrally to do with this phenomenon called totalitarianism. It's, there are now all kinds of questioning of that paradigm, right? People wanting to find a way out, find, finding that that's a very impartial and unsatisfactory uh, way to frame this crucial question about understanding our recent political social past. But it's hard. 
Once a paradigm is established, it's extraordinarily difficult to dislodge it. And that's in a discipline which doesn't, in my view, exist right next door to powerful interests that are going to tell it the questions and the means of approach that it wants. Thank you very much. All right? Just think of the way in which the proximity of interested corporate power will direct and warp and accelerate one path of inquiry and one path of inquiry only. That's the danger. I've got four minutes. Let me say two last things. A couple of things follow from this, it seems to me. Hard choices, first of all, hard choices face any university worth the name about what kind of corporate reconstruction of specific areas of research and teaching are legitimate, controllable, compatible with our educational mission, and our view of intellectual openness, and which are not. I think we botched the hard questions uh, on this subject over the recent years. Botched it badly, apropos of BP, for instance, and Novartis. Botched it scandalously, in my view. And I think the Udolf mission is to cruise ahead using the BP model as the model for the ownership of knowledge in the university in the university to come. So we've got to confront hard choices, hard cases, all right? I mean, there's going to be a very, very difficult borderline here. Supposing the National Rifle Association came along and uh, offered us the chance of financing a ballistics institute. <laughs> Would we, would we think that was appropriate to the university's intellectual uh, research mission? Well, maybe we wouldn't, right? You laugh. But of course, I mean, in, in relation to the BP example, it's a very difficult one. Or supposing focus on the family came along and said, we want to uh, found a center for the study of mental health and the monogamous, the monogamous family unit. Well, yes, again you laugh, right? It doesn't sound good, does it? <laughs> it doesn't sound good. But of course it presents us actually, if we compare it with the BP example, with quite a difficult quandary, right? Focus on the family is a perfectly good, you know, worthy part of, uh, of, of the social mainstream. So we have to face questions like this, sort of hard questions. They, they, I've given you two that are sort of highly colored. And many of them won't be highly colored at all. But they will be examples in which our only hope as an institution is to have open and sustained and serious debate about the kinds of lines we wish to draw, the kinds of patronage we're prepared to accept, the kinds of threats to intellectual integrity and dynamism that we see as dangerous. 